Good morning, all. We're here for an appeal hearing in the matter of CA 10, 2016, before the Chief Justice Michael Vlad, Justice Zaki Azmi, and His Excellency Justice Ali al Matani. The appellant is represented by Abdurrahman al Mazmi Advocates and Legal Consultants. Lead counsel is Muhammad Ahmed. The respondent is represented by Clyde and Co. Lead counsel is Mr. Harris Paul. I represent the, sorry, the appellant in these proceedings, Kassab Media FZ LLC. The lead attorneys for uh, Kassab, uh, the lead counsel, Mr. Nizam Al Nasir, who argued the court of first instance hearing, uh, has unfortunately had to leave the UAE on uh, emergency leave and appointed me uh, by virtue of a authorization letter uh, to act for the purposes of this hearing uh, only. Um, uh, you, you are from the same firm? I'm not from the same firm. So you are a counsel for uh, the firm on record? That's correct. Right. And you're Mr. Ahmed? That's correct. Right. Uh, before we proceed, I would like to address matters of housekeeping. Um, your your honors should have uh, three bundles in front of them. Uh, bundle A, the appeal bundle A, which constitutes the core documents. Uh, a bundle B, which contains the legal authorities on which the parties uh, uh, rely will, will rely upon. A, a third bundle, which is the respondent's uh, supplementary bundle, and which should also you should also have uh, the respondent's uh, skeleton argument uh, as well. The skeletons, uh, if there's only one skeleton on each side, then they should be in the uh, main bundle. What I have, what is, uh, so, so the respondent skeleton is in here, yes, okay, it's in the respondent one, the fine. Yes, that's right, yes, yes. Um, uh, for time, uh, schedule, and purposes, we don't believe the appellate's argument will take more than two hours at most. Um, but we will try to minimize time when, when we can. Um, in these hearings, in this, in this hearing, I will primarily be taking the court through the appellant's uh, skeleton argument, which can be <coughs> located in bundle A, uh, tab two, pages 24 through to uh, 43. I would like to start with a. Sorry. I would like to start with a recap of uh, the proceedings uh, that have taken place uh, to date. Uh, as the court is aware, uh, the respondent uh, claimant in, in, in the court proceedings is Sky News Arabia, FZLC, which is a free zone company established pursuant to the laws of the 2454 uh, media free zone in Abu Dhabi and having its parent primary place of business uh, in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. Uh, the appellant uh, defendant uh, in these proceedings is uh, Kassab Media FZ LLC, a free zone company established pursuant to the laws of Dubai Media City and having its offices in the said free zone. The dispute between the parties relates to, the, uh, to a supply of advertising and sponsorship representation agreement entered between the parties uh, on 1 July uh, 2003 and executed in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. A copy of the agreement can be found at Bundle A, Tab 13, pages 112 through to 134. Uh, I will be making references to the sponsorship agreement, which I'll uh, be referring to as the agreement uh, going forward. Um, uh, I will be making specifically a, um, references to the governing law and jurisdiction clause set up in clause 38.1 of the agreement, uh, which can be found at bundle A, tab 14. Is it set out in full in your skeleton? Sorry? Is the text of that provision set out in full in the skeleton? Uh, I believe it is, though. Did you say clause 38? Sorry? Did you say clause 38? 38.1, yes. 
I think it's at page 34, the one bundle. Although I think it's a selected extract. Uh, yes. Is yes. that sufficient for our purpose? I believe it will be. Okay. Uh, the respondent issued uh, its Part 8 application on 16 February 2016. Uh, a copy of the application can be found at uh, Bundle A, Tab 9, page 80. Uh, the appellant uh, filed its acknowledgement of service on 6 March uh, 2016, uh, indicating its intention to dispute the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts and that the Part 8 application procedure should not have been used, though that is outside the scope of, 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 of this hearing. Uh, a copy of the appellant's uh, acknowledgement of service can be found at Bundle A, Tab 10, pages 86 through to 87. In its original jurisdictional objection, the appellant contested that the BIFC court did not have jurisdiction to try the claim, or in the alternative, that if it did find that it had jurisdiction, uh, that it should not exercise its jurisdiction. Uh, his uh, Honor Justice uh, Shaman uh, uh, rejected the application uh, for reasons more particularly set out in his judgment uh, contained in bundle a, pages 1 through 311, uh, no tab. Um, what is, uh, are you still maintaining the same position? We are maintaining the same position, correct. What is the basis of saying if we have jurisdiction, we should not exercise it? The basis on which we are arguing that you should not exercise jurisdiction is the provisions of the commercial agency law, primarily. Uh, and that the agreement on its own is a void agreement, is an illegal contract, because it does not comply with the mandatory provisions of UAE law, being that with regards to commercial... This is a separate argument from your first uh, ground, which is that this court has no jurisdiction. Yes. And are you, would you be relying on that same provision in the uh, UAE law to say that it's a void contract? Or is it a separate ground? I'm just trying to understand. Yes. Normally, a court, if it has jurisdiction, will exercise it. Yes. So if you don't want the court to exercise the jurisdiction that it has, uh, there must be... I mean, the only uh, normal exception would be on the grounds of forum non-convenience, right? So what I'm trying to extract from you is are you relying on forum non-convenience? If you are not, then I'm just trying to understand on what principle of law uh, this court should not exercise jurisdiction if it does have jurisdiction. Uh, Maybe you can come to that later. And let's I could come to that later. De develop that when you're going to go to your second ground. Just Thank to flag to you that we need some guidance from you on this. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, just to start with, I will clarify that we are not relying on forum of convenience, though Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will get to that um, in, due, in due course. I mean, it may well be that you will say that uh, even if you have jurisdiction, uh, this case won't fly uh, for whatever reason, and, but that we have to be careful uh, with, to, to identify and see whether or not the other ground that you say the court should not decide the case is because uh, you have a valid defense on the merits, uh, but then that will be outside you know, the jurisdictional challenge as such, and you reserve that for a later date to determine. You, the way I understand, you are challenging that the agreement is illegal, isn't it? Because uh, it was not registered according to the some of the laws. That's correct. It's supposed to be registered. That is where you are saying the court should not exercise its discretion. That's correct, Your Honor. In essence, that's correct. Um, uh, as I, I would say, the, uh, the, the, his, uh, Excellency Justice uh, Shablan al uh, 
and Swalahi, uh, Swalahi, uh, rejected the applications, um, uh, the application uh, made by the uh, by Kassab, uh on various grounds, which are set out in in, in his judgment, pages one through to eleven. I will be going through uh, the points he made in his judgment uh, as well. Um, the appeal before the court uh, currently is that the court of first instance erred in rejecting the appellate's uh, jurisdictional challenges and raises the, the same points that were made in, in the court of first uh, instance. Uh, and those are, uh, sorry. But I thought uh, this principle of jurisdiction yes. is already quite well established by the standard Catholic case and the Tassim judgment? Uh, the appellant argues that there are sufficient differences in the facts of this dispute to warrant a, a different approach be taken, that there are enough, that the governing law provisions... You can distinguish, distinguish between Tassim and the operation yes, case and Senate Charter. That's yeah. correct, Your Honor. Um, the A summary of the appellant's uh, position with respect to the jurisdictional application can be found at pages 26 and 27 of our skeleton argument. Uh, and uh, it states that uh, uh, the first point was that the capacity of the appellant was that of an agent representative of the respondent uh, under the agreement. And the relationship between the parties is that of a contract proxies or contract agent under the provisions of Article 217 to 228 of Federal Law 18 of uh, Federal Law 18 of, two, of 1993, the Commercial Code, copies of which can be found at page 54 through 258. Um, uh, and that the agency activity under the agreement is subject to compliance of the respective provisions of UAE law number 1918 of 1981, regulating commercial agencies uh, as amended, which can be found at tab four, pages, sorry, no, not tab four, uh, tab six, um, pages 65 through to 72. And that as this is a relationship of contract proxy, then the provisions of Article uh, 226 uh, would apply, which is a mandatory provision of the law, uh, which cannot be opted out of. Where is that 226 again? Uh, Sorry, the... Article 226 will be at pages, it will be contained at page... Of the authorities bundle. Of the authorities bundle. Tem bundle B. Sorry. It'll be... It'll be on page 57, I believe. No, 58. Your Honor, there's another copy with that translation of um, bundle A, tab 19, page 204, which the court may wish to look at as well, the two different translations. Sorry. Right. Tab 19 is uh, an exhibit to the first witness statement of Susie R. Abel. That's right. She, she attaches um, a further copy a different translation of, of those articles. And which page have we found that? Page 204. Oh, 204. 205, I mean. Okay. But it's article uh, 228, isn't it? Uh, uh, no, 226, Your Honor. Okay. That's it. Okay. That's at page 205. The one that begins as an exception to the rules of jurisdiction. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Ahmed. Yes. I, I, I 
you should follow the standards of Article 226. And yes. I'm very new to this court, so can you be patient? Uh, how how is 226 relevant to your argument again? The argument that we are making in the appeal with regards to Article 226 is not that it should apply directly to the agreement, rather that the governing law clause uh, at 38.1 of the agreement is an opt-in to the DIFC courts, and that when exercising its decision to, uh, when interpreting whether article, whether the opt-in clause is valid, it needs to determine whether or not the opt-in is valid under the governing law of the contract. The appellant submits that the concept of consensual jurisdiction under uh, Article 5A2 of the, of the judicial authority law, um, in that exercising its, uh, uh, the, the opt-in, the court should go back to the original, um, the, the, the governing law of the agreement and decide whether or not uh, there is a valid opt-in under the uh, uh, under the laws governing the actual agreement. And that is the relevance of Article 226. Because it's the appellant's argument that if the court were to look at the wording of the governing law, which specifies UAE law as applicable in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, um, then that would mean that the IFC and Dubai laws do not apply and that it is a reference not to a specific provision of uh, it does not refer to UAE law generally, which would mean UAE law as applied in Dubai, as applied in the DIFC. The it would mean important words are, it depends on the place of the implementation of your contract. That's that what you're relying on? That's right. The you are saying your contract here, the implementation of your contract is in Abu Dhabi. The implementation of the contract is in the UAE as a whole. UAE as a whole. And our argument is that the only courts that could hear um, a dispute regarding the UAE as one territory would be the federal law, the federal courts of the UAE, which are situated in the capital. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as I was saying, the, 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 the grounds, uh, the, the summary of the appellant's uh, uh, position in respect to the uh, judgment um, uh, uh, in respect to its jurisdictional challenges set up on pages 26 and 27 of the uh, skeleton agreement uh, argument, sorry, uh, 27, 28 as well, sorry, 26 through to 28. Uh, and if the court will allow, I would like to just uh, get right into the, uh, the start of uh, uh, the grounds for, for the appeal and what we wish to argue. Uh, the claimant would like to stress that it did not ask the courts to directly apply the jurisdictional rules stated in Article 226 of the Commercial Code to reach the conclusion that the DIFC courts did not have jurisdiction to hear the claim. Again, Article 226 can be found at either tab 19, page 205, or uh, of bundle A, or in bundle B uh, on tab 4, page 58. Um, Rather, the appellant was asking the court first instance to invoke the voidness of the jurisdictional clause while determining compliance with the opt-in to the DIFC courts under Article 5A2 of the Judicial Authority Law. A copy of the Judicial Authority Law can be found at um, uh, Bundle B, Tab 8, pages 77 through 290. The appellant submits, sorry. Yes, go on. Sorry. Um, the appellant submits that Article 5A2 empowers the parties to consent to the jurisdiction uh, of the DIFC courts and that the concept of uh, consensual jurisdiction is not an innovation that's solely uh, adopted by the DIFC courts. The courts of uh, uh, 
onshore jurisdiction also apply uh, the, the, this concept of consensual jurisdiction to opt into a jurisdiction. But that is not to say that the court having received consensual jurisdiction does not review in the first place whether the jurisdictional clause itself has been made contrary and is not contra uh, is made correctly and is not contrary to the laws governing the agreement itself. Um, we refer to the DIFC Courts Practice Direction 1, 2015, which unfortunately I don't believe is actually in uh, the bundle. No, it is, sorry. It's in bundle B, uh, tab 12, pages 137, 138. Um, in the section titled Elective Jurisdiction of the DIFC Courts, uh, it reads, uh, while compliance with Article 5A2 of Dubai Law 12 as amended is ultimately a matter of interpretation by the courts, in the hearing the registry will accept the claim forms filed, the, filed by the parties which rely on Article 5A2 to invoke the jurisdiction of the DIFC courts if accompanied by submission agreements in one of the forms set up below, without prejudice to any subsequent challenge that may be made, that, made to that jurisdiction on the grounds that submission relied does not satisfy the requirements of Article 5A2, uh, which is the appellant's uh, claim that the... Uh, but, but this is only to say that the registry is bound to accept whatever you file. That's what you can challenge in court later. That's what... Uh, it doesn't confer anything else but to say that the registry is obligated to receive whatever you file. It doesn't confer any special powers or any interpretation of the... The appellant submits that while there is, it does not, as, as Your Honor rightly said, confer any sort of special um, power. It can be, it should be read as um, to help interpret yes. uh, Article 5A2. Okay. Like this direction 10205. Sorry, and it suggests, the appellant uh, submits, that it does suggest that before exercising its, uh, deciding on uh, whether or not there's a valid opt-in, that the court should look into whether or not there has been a valid opt-in into 5A2. Um, the appellant holds that, uh, therefore, it is a right of the court to interpret and review whether an opt-in is under Article 5A2 have been complied with either on its own motion or on a party's request. The appellant uh, submits that the opt-in contained at Clause 38.1 of the agreement does not comply with the jurisdictional gateway um, if the court applies the express wording of the said clause. Uh, again, contained at uh, 14 bundle A. Are you showing us Article 5A2? Sorry? Are you showing us the gateway clause? No, no. Uh, the gateway clause can be found in bundle B. Um, bundle B, tab 8. At page 86 and 87. and 87. I have to apologize. The first couple of pages of that, uh, uh, of, of, of this, um, It's 81, just 81 in my vendor. Sorry? 81 in my vendor, page 81. Ah, no, it's, uh, I apologize. Yes, yeah. 81 is the amendment on its own. The entire law starts at page 85. The amendment on its own. The entire law starts at page 84. Well, I think she just only asked you about the article. Oh, okay. In that case, That's yes, cool. you can look at... You can certainly look at page 81, yes, Your Honor. Uh, which 5A2 uh, states, uh, the court of first instance may hear and determine any civil or commercial claims or actions where the parties agree in writing to file such a claim or action with it, whether before or after the dispute arises, provided that such agreement is made pursuant to specific clear and express provisions. Uh,
The appellant would like to draw the court's attention to Articles 8 and 9 of the IFC. Not, not from that paragraph. The such agreement is made pursuant to specific, clear, and express provisions. That's correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Um, If the court applies the express wording of the set clause uh, of Article 38.1, particularly with regards to governing law, not the jurisdictional aspect, the governing law aspect of that clause, um, the appellant submits that the opt-in, uh, the, the clause itself is void. The clause itself, the actual jurisdictional and governing law, uh, the jurisdictional clause is in and of itself void. Yeah, but, but if you read that clause 38, the last few words, read yes. the, the last few words of that, that's where that clause. Yes, it does, act, it, it does say that the agreement on any issues or disputes arising out of or in connection with it, whether contractual or non-contractual, such as claims of tort, breach, breach of statute, or regulation, or otherwise, will be governed by and construed with the laws of the United Arab Emirates as applicable in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi and subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of the DIFC court. Yes. yes, exclusive and subject to the yes. exclusive jurisdiction. Isn't that specific, clear, and express enough? It, <laughs> it is express and specific, yes, that is true. But our argument is that... So you concede that it is express and, 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 and it's clear? The argument that we are making is not that there yeah, are I know, express I understand. words. Yes. The argument that we are making is that looking at this clause and when determining whether or not the court should take jurisdiction under 5A2, the court first needs to be satisfied that the governing law and jurisdiction, the opt-in into the DIFC courts, is actually a valid opt-in under the law of the agreement. And we submit that the law of the agreement is the UAE laws as applied in Abu Dhabi because yeah, there but, are... But your, your contest here today before us is jurisdiction, not the issue of what law to apply here. You're, you're challenging, we cannot, we do not have the jurisdiction to hear your, to, to, to even look at your, your case. That's your, that's your case. You're looking at what the jurisdiction and the last, paragraph, last few words of your 38 and you concede the submission is specific, clear, and express as to comply with the, 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 the law, Article 5.2, that you were reading through just now. Uh, yes, the wording is clear. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we are saying is that... You are saying that because the law is emirate law, then the DIFC does not have jurisdiction. This is in essence. That's what you're saying. In essence, correct. What we're saying is that because the governing law is UAE and there are very clear and express specific words as to which UAE law is to apply, that the court interpreting the, uh, should interpret this governing law and jurisdiction clause as it is written, as which the court is required to do under articles 8 and 9 of the IFC law 10 of 2005. Article 8 states, the existence, validity, effect, interpretation, and performance of a contract, or any term thereof, including any requirements as to formality, shall be determined by the law which governs it. And Article 9 then states that an express choice of governing law in a contract shall be effective against all persons affected thereby. So, going back to Clause 38.1, there is a clear intention by the parties that the federal laws as applicable in Abu Dhabi shall govern the agreement. But the and the effect of these Articles 8 and the, the, the Articles 8 and 9 have the same effect. 
when the parties expressly agree to specific wording, these laws, uh, the, the, the law shall be, used to, uh, shall be used for all matters in relation thereto, including the appellant submits uh, jurisdiction and whether or not jurisdiction has been opted into correctly uh, um, under the original governing law of the, of the agreement. Now, the court of first instance um, relied on the case of investment group private limited and standard chartered bank in determining the applicability of UAE law um, uh, in the DIFC. And in that matter, um, it was found that uh, UAE law does not apply in the IFC by virtue of Article uh, 3, Subsection 2 of Federal Law 8 of 2004, a copy of which can be found. Sorry, where is my index? Yes. Uh, at tab 7, uh, bundle B, tab 7, pages 73 through to 76. Um, the appellant submits that there are sufficient uh, differences between this matter and the facts in the dispute of investment group uh, uh, private limited IGPL uh, to distinguish itself. Uh, in the IGPL matter, the Court of Appeal uh, found that the uh, that uh, uh, SCB, the, the defendant in that case, was a licensed establishment and therefore... Just hold uh, on a minute. Uh, I, are you trying to show us the... Uh case itself, the case report? Uh, no, I'm not trying, I'm just summarizing the uh, the grounds on which we believe that there's a distinction between. Well, it'd be best if we turn to that case. Yes, of course. Tab 14. Um, it's contained at bundle B. Tab 14. Tab 14, correct. Well, you know, before you get there, wouldn't it help to actually explain uh, what the conflict is between uh, what has been done in this case and the law that you say violates. Because as uh, Justice Zaki said, you know, reading it at first instance, not, we're not clear uh, how your argument actually works. Uh, so we need a detailed examination by you of Article 226 to explain how you get to the conclusion that for certain classes of contract, you cannot opt into the IFC court jurisdiction. That's the heart of the case, isn't it? Correct. But then you can get to questions of case law and so on. Of course. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in order to, uh, the, the, the preliminary argument is that uh, the agreement specifies. Where is it uh, developed, is this particular argument in your skeleton? Uh, it's primarily set out uh, in pages 39 through to argument is also made in the skeleton arguments for the court of first instance, but I understand that um, that might not be sufficient. Well, your argument starts at uh, 8.3, does it, at the bottom of page 39? Yes, that's correct. You see, what I don't find is uh, an explanation of how Article 226 applies to this particular contract. That's the heart of your argument, that it's not been developed. You just quote Article 226. You say it's mandatory, and you go on to say, therefore. Uh, I, I think, you know, there's a little bit of reasoning missing there. Is there is a gap in reasoning, yes. Um, you, you did mention just now that the whole of the UAE, the place of 
the place of implementation of the contract is the whole of UAE. Yes. You said that. Correct. So following that, you are saying that um, by virtue of 226, the IFC law does not apply. Is that what you mean? I'm trying to understand the way the Chief Justice is trying to understand. I'm trying to help you <laughs> explain to us. No? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. No, the argument that is being made is not that the area it, um, If I could just try to explain why Article 226 is of any... I understand that it's not particularly well developed in the skeleton argument, but I am able to describe why we get to the position that Article 226 should apply, mm -hmm. and it's why then the UAE courts, the UAE federal courts, are the correct forum to hear this dispute. Go on. Okay. The appellant uh, contends that to, to understand why federal law applies, we need to understand the relationship between the parties uh, under the agreement. Uh, the appellant submits that the actual relationship between itself and uh, 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 the respondent is one of contracts proxy, uh, as more said, uh, particularly defined in Article uh, 217 and 218 of the Commercial Code, uh, copies of which can be found. Uh, again, in tab A, in bundle A, Page 204 of uh, bundle A, tab, uh, tab uh, 19. We'll just go with that translation because it reads. Um, it, 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 it out Did you say 204? Uh, page 204, bundle A, tab 19. Do you get into article number? I'm referring to a article 217 and 218. Article 217 identified, says that states that a contract agency is a contract by which a person is bound in a continuing manner in a particular field of activity to initiate negotiation for the conclusion of transactions in the principal's interest for a fee. His task may include the conclusion and implementation of such contracts in the name and on the account of the principal, on account of the principal. The appellant submits that the, the agreement, uh, the, 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 the agreement, satisfies all of the requirements and um, uh, uh, all the requirements under this Article Two One Seven, uh, on a continuous basis, is satisfied by way of Clause Three Point One of the agreement, uh, which specifies a term of five years and six months. Uh, this can be found at uh, Bundle A. Tab 13, page 114. The requirement that there be an area of specific activity is again satisfied by way of clause 3.1, which specifies the activity of selling all advertising and sponsorship on the Sky channels. Um, the third requirement of urging a negotiation to enter into transactions to the interest of the principal is satisfied by way of clause 3.5, of the of the agreement, which is uh, bundle A, tab you know, thirteen. This agreement is not necessarily readily comprehensible by someone not in the trade. So you have to explain in plain language what is exactly the nature of this contract. What are the duties of uh, the parties to each other, and then you then tell us explain why this particular contract, because of its particular characteristics comes within the definition of Article 217. And you have, have not shown us yet the link between Article 217 and 226. Uh, I will be getting to that, uh, Your Honor. Um, but in brief, the link between 217 and 226 is that 
the appellant argues that if all of the requirements of the agreement, if the agreement satisfies the definition of a contract proxy or agent, then it, by virtue of Article, then the provisions of Article 226 must apply. That's the argument that's being put forward. It's not just that the agreement satisfies the requirements of Article 217 of the agencies, of the commercial code, but also that it satisfies the independent, it maintains, it has the hallmark independence criteria set out in Article 218 of the same law. And that if the court looking at the agreements, if the court accepts the arguments that are being made by the appellant, which is that this agreement, on a plain English reading of the agreement, hits all of those notes, as it were, then the provisions of Article 217 through to 228, which is the relevant part of the commercial code that applies to commercial, to contracts agencies, must apply. So Article 226 is the clause that provides that, as an exception to the rules of jurisdiction provided for in the Civil Procedures Code, the court in which jurisdiction lies is the place of implementation of the contract. You're not exactly making this argument easy for us. I apologize, Your Honor. Let's go back to basics. I'm asking you, tell us what the people are supposed to do under this contract. Then, you know, tell us why it meets the definition. All you do is you cite provisions. And I can tell you that the provisions are not very clear to me. Right? So you have some background. You explain it. And if your account of it is incorrect, the other counsel will correct you in due course. So, but we want to hear your case. And tell us why do you think that this particular contract fits the definition of a contract agency or a contract proxy, depending on which translation you look at. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. So, you know, you have to take us back to the contract and explain it to us. What was this deal about? And then you link it to the, I mean, you can give us a factual background, which may or may not be controversial. And then from there, you take us to the contract and then explain how the contract works. Thank you, Your Honor. I mean, is there a statutory definition of a contract or agency? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, Your Honor? 217 isn't that clear. So I think we need a little bit of elucidation. Tell us what the contract is about. Yes, okay. So the contract was entered into by Sky News Arabia as principal. We contend as principal. Yeah, what does Sky News Arabia do? We start with this kind of basic information. Thank you, Your Honor. Sky News Arabia is a news channel, I think is the best way to describe it. It's a TV channel. It's a TV channel, yes. They sell advertising space on the channel. And in its most simple terms, Kassab Media was appointed as the exclusive agent to find buyers of advertising space. That's, in essence, what this agreement is about. I don't know. What is the nature of the contractual relationship between Sky Media and Kassab? We contend that the agreement... You see, you know, agency is a very tricky word in commercial law, regardless of whatever governing law you're talking about. Many people are called agents who are not truly agents. All right? So describe the way in which a contract is made for the sale of space for Sky Media, which involves Kassab and the end advertiser. Your Honor, I'm afraid I don't... Don't have instructions on that? I don't have instructions on that. If you don't have the evidence on that, we have a little bit of difficulty. Let me give you another example. You go to London and you want to see a show. You don't want to go to take the trouble to go to the theatre and buy tickets. 
Sometimes you go to the theater, the theater says, we have no tickets to sell. You have to go to the uh, authorized agents. When you go to the authorized agents, then you buy a ticket for the show. The show is being put on by the producer, or the promoter of the show. But the person who buys the tickets, his contract is with the ticket agency. The ticket agency buys on block a, a, a bunch of seats you know, for the end customers. So, you know, when you talk about an agent, is he truly an agent? Because the end customer has actually no contractual relationship with the people who are putting on the show. Likewise, that's why you explained to me, I would like you to tell me, what, how, how is this deal structured? How is the contractual relationship? Does Kassam take a block of space and then they have the exclusive rights to sell it? <coughs> do they sell it? Do they sell it in their own name? Or do they sell it as agent for Sky News? Or do they simply say, I sell you the space, I guarantee you that Sky News will give you a slot? Yes. That's what you have to you have to analyze this contract in order to fit it into the statutory definition. I thank you for the uh, clarification and instructions, Your Honor. Well, um, this is my problem. In my, this is your, uh, so you you have to help me solve the problem. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have the answers for you. I do not, um, quite frankly understand how this agreement, the, the, the nature of this You see, don't forget, I mean, under UAE law of contract, we need to go and examine what exactly was the intention of the parties. What was the true intention of the parties? Right. Not simply just the words of the contract. And neither, neither party has, uh, I suppose, has yet given us uh, much uh, factual evidence about this. But why don't you uh, explain then to us the way you look at this contract? Uh, just suppose you don't have any uh, instructions on the, the factual arrangements. Um, look at this contract and then explain to us how you analyze it so as to bring yourself within uh, the terms uh, of the definition. The way I would look at it is that I would break down, first I would look at the provisions of Article 217, Your Honor, and identify that there are four, four elements of a contract's proxy relationship. I would then look at the agreement and yeah, see... Where, where does the proxy relationship arise from? The... We contend, our understanding is that it is from Article 217 itself that if the four requirements of a contract's proxy are satisfied, then that is evidence of a relationship of contract's proxy. Looking at the four requirements in the law and then identifying those elements well, within the actual contract. Let, let's look at the, the last line of our 2217. I'm just looking at the uh, definition in bundle B at the moment. And I think the, the critical element is what do you mean by a contract proxy or an agency contract? And I suppose it should be the agent's job may include conclusion and execution of the translation the transactions in the name and to the account the principal. <coughs> so that, I suppose, conforms with my understanding of what is an agent. You contract purely as a conduit, putting together the ultimate parties to the contract. So is this what Kassab is doing? That they sell, but they always sell only on behalf of Sky News and the advertiser understands that if there's any issue about the terms of the contract, they will have to sue Sky News or Sky News will have to sue um, the uh, advertiser. I don't see that specifically explained subject to um, something I'm, that you may point out. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I read somewhere this morning that there's the word principal used in the agreement in one of the paragraphs. There's the word principal. No, to be fair, there, there is language in the agreement yeah. which is consistent with pure agency. There's also language which is not. 
That's why I'm not very clear what actually was supposed to be the core. And if you accept that my kind of basic criteria for what is a true agency contract is are you selling on behalf of Sky and the customer so that the contract is made ultimately between Sky and the customer and Kassab just drops out of the picture and takes a commission or whatever else that he gets for putting the two together. But you uh, see, if you look at 3.5 for example, Kassab will be entirely responsible for the fulfillment of any of his agreements with clients <coughs> and client agencies for any Kassab sales and Kassab will be solely responsible for and any liabilities under such agreements. Mm. So, if Sky doesn't deliver or he has a complaint about the, you know, the, my advertisement was not correctly screened or it wasn't the way that I wanted it, the customer has to sue whom? If it is a, by reading this clause 3.5, it would be Kassab. If it's a Kassab, it would sue Kassab. It would sue Kassab. Yeah, so Kassab then has got to go and get an indemnity from Sky or whatever. Yes. You see, in, in which case then you have two separate contracts, right. one between Sky and Kassab, and Kassab says, I'll undertake to take, a, 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 possibly, I don't know whether that would be reality, but, but it could be that they're saying, you give me a block of time and I will sell it, uh, and then I'll take care of the customers, and then all you need to see is the money passing through to you, uh, and then we'll split the money. Because it's not, the, the, the remuneration arrangements were not typical of agency, which is where you take you know, a percentage of the sale price. Here, there's actually a fee and then they divide it in uh, percentages which are relatively large uh, on, the, on the part of the staff. So I, I really don't understand the commercial basis of this agreement. Which I think is quite important to determining whether it is captured by your uh, definition. So it's quite central to your argument. It is quite central to the argument. Unfortunately, I have not been instructed Okay, let, let, let's uh, then make, make it e easier for you. Uh, I don't want to give you a hard time. Uh, just take us through, you know, th finish off your argument in the way you want, and then we'll hear from your opponent, and then if you still have doubts, we'll ask you again. Yeah, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, but uh, I, the, the, the argument that we've put forward is, uh, that we propose is actually not particularly complex. It just identifies the... Uh, the, the, the well, so far as I understand your argument, what you're saying is this. Um, we think that this contract clearly falls within the definition of 217. That's correct. And the law is straightforward yes. that if you have a contract that is covered by Article 217, then uh, it will be captured by Article 226. And you say that the interpretation of 226 is that... Uh, the court in the place of performance uh, is the co only court that has jurisdiction, right? That's and, and even then I have some problems because that's not exactly the way the English translation expresses it. Uh, because it's not unknown in Arabic, uh, in legal terms. Uh, when they talk about jurisdiction, um, they can say um, exclusive jurisdiction, which is what we have, for example, in the defined areas where we have jurisdiction, that jurisdiction is exclusive. Uh, and the legislature knows how to use the word exclusive. They have not used the word exclusive. All is, so if you read it in the English translation, to be fair, it, it may suggest simply that that particular court is one of the courts that has jurisdiction. It's an enabling clause, not necessarily a, uh, a defining clause. But I'm just explaining to you my doubts. I, don't, I really don't want to distract you from your argument, you know, otherwise you'll be prolonging it necessarily. So, but have I understood you so far? That, that's uh, what you're saying. It's kind of ABC for you, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, okay, now go back and, and, and finish off your, your argument. Uh, so, what we were saying is that the uh, four identifying 
uh, features in the contract's proxy are satisfied if you look at the agreements at certain provisions of the agreement. All right. Uh, Just highlight those again for, for our report. Sure. Okay. So the first requirement is that there be uh, a contract proxy is uh, uh, it, it, there needs to be uh, the work needs to be carried out on a continual continuous basis. We submit that that is uh, that is satisfied by way of uh, clause 2.1 oh, yeah, okay. of the agreement. Sorry. <coughs> Where is the term of the contract? Uh, uh, clause 2.1, I believe. 2.1, yes. Okay. Uh, commencing on the effective date being <coughs> the 1st of July 2013 and continue for a period of five years and six months. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there is a, a, a term, uh, a continuous term. Um, the agreement needs to specify a specific activity which uh, is set out in clause 3.1 and 3.1, uh, uh, which is subject to clause 3.2, uh, but sets out that Kassab is appointed uh, for the term as the exclusive media representative for SNA, which is Sky News Arabia, I believe, uh, in the territory. The territory includes the UAE, uh, responsible for selling all advertising and sponsorship on the channel, on the website, and mobile services. So those are the specific activities that are being carried out. Uh, yes, go on. Yes. Uh, the urging uh, and negotiating to enter into transactions in the interest of the principal uh, requirement in Article 217 is uh, set up in Clause 3.5, which states Kassab will be entirely responsible for the fulfillment of any of its agreements with clients and or client agencies for any Kassab sale, and Kassab will be solely responsible for any and all liabilities under such agreements. Uh, Where is the definition of the services? Uh, it's contained at uh, Schedule 1 of the agreement, which starts at uh, page 129, the... Uh, services doesn't seem to be the uh, services isn't defined. It's a page, page Uh, and uh, the requirement that uh, uh, it be against payment is satisfied by the payment terms set out in Clause 9 of the agreement. Uh, 9.1 sets out the percentages of net revenue payable. Uh, 9.2 specifies a minimum payment, a minimum revenue guarantee of 2.5 million US dollars. And, um, so on. The argument for a commercial agency is uh, a complex proxy, rather, uh, is strengthened by what the appellant believes is compliance with Article 218 uh, of the Commercial uh, Code, which states that a contract agency may exercise uh, the business of the proxy and manage its commercial activities separately and shall bear alone expenses required to carry out this activity, his activity. Um, we submit that the fact that 
the uh, appellant is bearing all costs in relation to carrying out its duties uh, under clause 5.1 of the agreement. Sorry, uh, just say that again. Uh, sorry, how, where would you like me to start? Uh, you're gonna, uh, you are explaining the significance of 5.1. Uh, yes, sir. Um, okay, uh, clause 5.1 specifies that uh, CASA will secure um, outdoor advertising assets for Sky News Arabia on non-exclusive basis in each of the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Oman, uh, of value not less than one million and uh, value not the, uh, I'm not quite sure I understand what are outdoor advertising assets I would for imagine SNA, which is a TV channel yes so are we talking about some electronic board yeah. Billboards, you think? I, they're bill, I think they're billboards, but um, I, I don't know if they're electronic billboards or if they're actually, if it's advertising for, if, if Sky News Arabia maintains an outdoor advertising business is something that unfortunately I don't know. Um, Uh, but what we were saying is that Article 5.1 suggests that there is a uh, that that the costs of carrying out uh, the, 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 that the costs in relation to carrying out this activity are going to be borne by Kassab and also that um, you know the, the the requirement that they manage the commercial activity separately is satisfied by the fact that Kassab is a standalone company and is not a subsidiary or a, uh, uh, a related company to Sky News Arabia. The appellant submits that these are all important to, to keep in mind because once the relationship of the contract proxy is made, then the provisions of Article 226 apply which states as, as an exception to the general rules of jurist, uh, as an exception to the rules of jurisdiction provided for in the Civil Procedures Code, uh, the court in which jurisdiction lies the place of implementation, that the contract shall be competent to try any disputes arising from the contract proxy. What I, it, 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 it is a, the, the way the approach the appellate has taken is, if A then B, then C must apply. And that's the approach that we are that we are arguing. Um, and that is the relevance of what happens if the contract were for performance of services in a selected number of Emirates and not the entire UAE? Then which court would have jurisdiction? It would be the uh, the appellant. Sorry, it would be the. It would be the court in which, in relation to that specific transaction, where that transaction arose. So, if it were in relation, let's say, there are six Emirates in an agreement, and uh, there are three uh, independent courts. Uh, uh, being Abu Dhabi. Right. So, it's, let, let's say in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and Sharjah, right? Yes. Um, and he's got responsibility for selling advertising in the just these three and not the other Emirates. Uh, the appellant argues that if he, it, I'm sorry, could you repeat which three? Uh, just by uh, way of They're just time. random. Let's say Dubai, UAE yeah. and Sharjah. Uh, we would say that the correct venue for hearing that case would be the federal courts in Sharjah. But what about uh, transactions in Dubai? Because the agreement specifies Emirates that have their own judicial systems and ones that subscribe to the federal courts. Yeah. It's the appellant's argument that the, the federal courts have um, uh, supremacy over the local courts. Well, that would not, strictly speaking, important. you know, you will not find that proposition uh, expressly <coughs> spelled out in 226. No, you will not. Well, I'm just trying to test your argument to see whether your interpretation makes sense. Um, 
because if one could imagine an, an alternative theory just from the point of legal sensibility is to say, well, if you're going to perform in uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Sharjah, then you can pick any of these courts because they theoretically have jurisdiction uh, over the contract because the contract is one contract. Uh, so you can perform in two or three places. Um, and, and the contract says you can perform, in fact, in every one of the three places, uh, but not elsewhere. So shouldn't, could you not apply Article 226 to allow for any court, or rather, where the contract is capable of or required for performance, uh, in any number of places, then in any of these places where there is a court, then that court will have jurisdiction. Even if the actual transaction does not occur. Because the other way of looking at it is if it is uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi and Sharjah, then it all depends when the sale was made. So if the sale to the end customer was made in Dubai, then Dubai courts would have jurisdiction uh, and, and so on. And that is not envisaged uh, specifically by Article 226, but it's certainly a possible uh, interpretation. But anyway, look, let, let me just, you know, leave that in the air. Uh, I appreciate it's difficult for you to respond uh, immediately. So, uh, carry on with uh, highlighting the other relevant clauses that you want to see. Can, can may, may, may I, of course, may I assist uh, the, the council? If you read through the appointment, the appointment, the clause, the clause three of the agreement, you read through them one by one. Can you conclude whether there are Kasap is an agency in the context of the agency or is he a principal? Take for example 4.1. All revenues from sales secured by CNA prior to effective date will be for SNA's account. Yes. So it goes straight to the principal's account. Yes. And perhaps that will support your argument that Kasat is an agent yeah. in the context. So, so, sorry, sorry, no, sorry to just clarify this point for my brother, uh, Judge. 4.1 actually refers to a particular period prior to this agreement coming into place. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so it's relating to historical, it is a tidying up of the historical uh, events. I see. Uh, just for clarification, 4.2 is also um, provides some clarity because it refers to SNA's to continue to secure sales with ADMIC clients. So it's a relation to those clients and SNA has direct, direct contractual relations with. Oh, I see. So in, in respect of those clients, uh, CASAP has no hope, no right. Is that what you're saying? But that's what I'm saying. The, uh, the and who are the ADMIC clients? They're listed in the schedule. Uh, I... They're listed in the schedule at the back. Uh, yeah, but I couldn't figure out uh, it's set up at Schedule 2, um, page 134, the ADMIC clients. Mm -hmm. But commercially, specific. it's not, uh, how should I put it? Commercially, we don't understand why they are put into that category. You know, what is the significance of these particular clients? Um, they <coughs> seem to be uh, UAE. And I don't even know whose clients they are. I suppose they are SNAA clients, right? They're called SNA clients. Sorry, what was your explanation? Uh, ADMIC clients are, just reading through them, they are all either government or government-backed entities. Mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be the common... Seems like Abu Dhabi Media something. Yeah, Abu Dhabi Media, uh, I would suspect it would have been Abu Dhabi Media Incorporated. Yeah. Which used to, which is, uh, I believe, one of the parent companies for Sky. Oh, one of the uh, shareholders in Sky News Arabia. See, yeah, and then you've got four point seven, which says, oh yeah, SNN is responsible for 
delivery, inventory, and collection of revenues from any and all uh, SNA. Oh, SNA clients. Okay, so yeah, it, it, it's a bit complicated, right? There are different clients and treated differently. I think it's it's uh, the, the the usage of the word exclusive is maybe used incorrectly in this agreement. It's not really an exclusive. It's more of a sole agent uh, arrangement, whereby. As a third part, as far as far as a an authorized you know third party, Kassab is the only authorized third party, and um, uh, Sky News Arabia is entitled to continue selling or approaching its own clients to uh, to, to, to sell advertising space. There are also def definitions of SMA international clients and SMA clients, which are referred to as clause four point two at page one thirty. So you can see definitions there. Looking for the definition of direct client. That's at page 131. But this has been ruled by the another court, isn't it, on this issue? Has it not been real ruled by another court, or I'm, have I misread the... I'm sorry, in relation to what issue? On the question of whether this is an agency or not. There is a reference to a judgment um, that uh, is set out in bundle B. Uh, uh, in bundle B, uh, it's a Dubai Court of Cassation, I um, know uh, a Federal Supreme Court of Cassation case, I'm sorry. Federal Court of Cassation has refused to entertain. And that is one of the reasons why the judge decided against you. Yes, actually. The, the judgment is actually set out in tab 15, bundle B, uh, tab 16, bundle B, sorry. Uh, Dubai Court of Cassation judgment 447-2003. I write, I write to read the cassation judgment, but I, I, I couldn't quite follow it. But the, the, the judge at first instance did mention that case, and I'm giving that is one of the reasons why. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry. The, the judge at first instance considered also the decision of the cassation court. Uh, yes, in relation to commercial agencies, I believe. Uh, commercial yes. agency. Yes. So you are still raising that point before us? Uh, the How point about commercial agencies? Yeah. Uh, I would mention it as the alternative argument to why the court should not. It's got nothing to do with 226? No, that has nothing to do okay, with Okay, sorry, I misunderstood. That secondary argument has secondary. to do with Articles okay. 2 and 3 of the Commercial sorry, Agency as well. Uh, Please carry on, Mr. Affe. Yes. Uh, so we find uh, the appellate is of the uh, opinion that because there is a um, uh, Contracts agency under Article uh, 217, then the provisions of Article 226 must apply. But uh, the core argument remains that the only reason we're talking about Article 226 and it's, uh, you know, what it states is because if we look at Article 226, which we maintain is a mandatory provision of the law that cannot be contracted out of, then the court will if applying the law of the agreement, we'll find that there has not been a valid opt-out into the DIFC court's jurisdiction. So the, 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 the governing law jurisdiction clause on its own is null and void, and therefore the fallback provisions of UAE law generally should apply instead. That is at its essence what the, 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 the appellant is, is arguing. Uh, and that's why we have these arguments as to uh, Article 226 and its applicability, uh, why we are beginning to talk about a contracts agency uh, to, to, to begin with. And uh, so, why we cannot consider the FC court as one of the court are meant by this article? Before you said you represent Sky, or sorry, you are an agency for Sky News, and then the entire Emirates, 
Exactly. You just said that. Yes. And in this yes. article it says, report to the exam where the course where is the contract performed. So you, if you perform your contract in the entire country, that must include also the DRC itself, without an alert to Dubai, or specifically in this specific zone of Dubai. So wh why you want to exclude the DRC from the <coughs> meaning of the, like, uh, uh, the court where the contract is performed? The of you performing your contract in the entire Emirates? Yes, yes. Uh, the main reason for that is it's a constitutional argument set out in Article 104 in the Constitution. Uh, Article 4, uh, uh, Article 104, subsection 3 in particular, specifies that where a contract is executed in the state capital, then the, state, the courts of that state capital shall have jurisdiction. Unfortunately, Article 104, I don't believe, is actually in any of the bundles? In the bundle. Ah, uh, no, wait. Or even in your skeleton? It is mentioned in the, oh, I'm sorry. It is mentioned in the skeleton, but it is mentioned only in passing at page. Oh. Without, without the actual quotation? Without the actual quotation. Ah. Without the actual quotation. Sorry, have you uh, ascertained whether you do have it or don't have it? Yes, it's contained in bundle B. Uh-huh. Pass one. Sorry, the reference was not to Article 104, it was actually uh, Article 102. Um, it sets up the Federation shall have one or more federal courts of first instance seated in the permanent capital of the Federation, uh, being Abu Dhabi, uh, or in the capital of some Emirates, uh, in order to perform their judicial functions within the jurisdiction in the following lawsuits. Uh, subsection 1, civil, commercial, and administrative litigation between the Federation and individuals where the Federation is a plaintiff. Two crimes um, uh, perpetrated within the boundaries of the permanent federal capital, except for those crimes that fall within the jurisdiction of the Federal Supreme Court uh, under Article 99 of the Constitution. And three, which is the subsection we're relying on, uh, personal status, civil, commercial, and other litigations between individuals that arise in the permanent federal capital. And we submit that since this agreement was executed in Abu Dhabi, that it arises out of Abu Dhabi, and therefore the federal courts in Abu Dhabi uh, uh, are, the, are the correct court, uh, as opposed to why, to, to, to answer your honor's question as to why we would not bring the action uh, to Dubai or the DIFC. Uh, which was the last section that you were using? Uh, it's Article 102, subsection 3, on page 29 uh, in tab 1. But again, reading the English, um, Article 102, sub Article 3, um, talks about there are many adjectives, but only one noun. And the noun is litigation. Litigation between individuals that arise in the permanent federal capital. So a litigation typically arises where you file your claim, no? Uh, that's usually the case, but the appellant uh, argues that the meaning of those words is where the agreement is executed. Again, you know, we may have to check the arrow. Yeah, but that doesn't mean all cases like uh, I mean, arise in Abu Dhabi would go to the federal court uh, in, in Abu Dhabi. There is something wrong with this article. I'm sure there is sort of introduction. This is a very specific uh, jurisdiction given to the federal courts. 
system in Abu Dhabi. Otherwise, the interpretation of this, all cases in Abu Dhabi must go to the federal court, not to the Abu Dhabi uh, domestic court. Anyway, um, again, to move things along, we, we've noted your point. Yep. We, we will do a little bit of research yep. on our own later. Um, so you've made that point now. Um, you, your, your clients are relying on this provision. Okay. You, you, want, to finish, you want to try and finish off uh, your, your argument? I, I hope we have not uh, I prevented you from no, developing no, no, anything no, no. The, that you the, want the, to. The, uh, as the as your honor knows, the arguments are set out in the skeleton argument uh, right. itself, and those are ultimately the arguments that should be uh, uh, referred to when it comes to deciding the issue of jurisdiction. Um, uh, just uh, keeping in mind that yeah, I'm one ready. finish by by one. So it, yes, that's right. If you can wrap up, but but we'll, we'll give you a few minutes at the end okay. just um, to respond to. Your sure. Um, basically, uh, we just wanted to uh, just like to draw attention to the decisions that were uh, referred to in the court first instances uh, um, analysis of the law. Uh, we maintain that that matter of Gainer and Gavin and IGPL and Standard Chartered Bank, uh, SCB, uh, don't directly apply uh, in this in in this here. In both of those cases, we had very general governing law provisions that spoke for, well, uh, at least, yes, uh, UAE laws generally, which the court had interpreted to mean UAE law as applicable in Dubai, as applicable in the DIFC. Those uh, cases are all in the bundles. Those are all in the bundles, yes. Gainer, uh, Gavin and Gainer and uh, IGPL are in the bundle. Uh, we submit that the limiting word, the very clear limitation of as applicable in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi uh, is enough to differentiate the governing law provisions in our agreement as opposed to the governing law provisions in those two agreements. Uh, furthermore, the court found that it had jurisdiction on the grounds of Article 5A1 in those agreements, um, which is not really the, the situation we have before us so now. We're now Ultimately, the question is that we are asking is whether or not the opt-in under the jurisdiction clause, clause 38.1, is, um, is correct, is, is valid under the governing law of the agreement. Um, to, 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 to summarize, I'd just like to draw the court's attention to the points raised uh, by the uh, uh, appellant in its skeleton arguments, particularly pages 37 through to uh, uh, 38, which sets out why oh, skeleton, in, right? in the skeleton, yes, um, which sets out how the appellant believes the, uh, the court erred in its decision in the court of first instance. Uh, I'll just quickly read through those. Um, the court failed to apply the provisions of Article 6 of the Judicial Authority Law. Uh, which is a governing law uh, clause uh, uh, in, in, in the law, uh, which reads that the courts shall apply the sector's law and regulations except where the parties to the dispute have explicitly, explicitly agreed that another law shall govern such dispute, provided that such law does not conflict with public policy and public morals. Uh, B, fail to apply the provisions of Article 8 of the IFC Law 10 of 2005 regulating the application of the IFC laws which reads the existence, validity, effect, and performance of a contract or any term thereof, including its requirements as to formality, shall be determined by the law which governs it. C, which states that uh, 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 the court failed to apply Article 9 of the same law, which states that the express choice of governing law in a contract shall be effective against all persons affected thereby. D, failed to apply the provisions of Article 11.1 of the same law, which relates to agents, uh, which says where an agent is appointed under the contract, the capacity and authority of the agent shall be determined by the law which governs the contract. Misapplied, he misapplied um, and misinterpreted provisions of Article 3, uh, subsection 2 of Federal Law 8 of 2004 regarding the applicability of uh, UAE federal and civil laws in uh, the DIFC and the financial free zones. Uh, fundamental in F fundamentally changed the inter uh, meaning uh, of the um, 
uh, governing law clause uh, and did not apply the provisions of governing law as set out in the agreement, instead uh, stating that uh, a reference to UAE law as applicable in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi must have meant UAE law as applicable in generally, which would mean Dubai and therefore the DIFC. Um, G, for the law 18 of 1981 regulating commercial agencies. Um, fail to apply federal law 18 of 1993 on the commercial code, in particular article 226. Um, fail to apply provisions of articles 31, 126 D, 127, 210, subsections one and two of the civil code, which unfortunately I haven't had the uh, opportunity to, to, to discuss. Um, and it states two additional, uh, two additional grounds, uh, not giving consideration to um, uh, rules on jurisdiction and the, the, the division of jurisdiction is set up in a Dubai Court of Cassation judgment. Um, and uh, by Article 104 of the Constitution and Federal Law 6 on establishing the federal courts, which is also included in the bundle. <coughs> Um, the actual conclusions uh, of, the, of, the, of the appellant are set out in pages <coughs> 9, uh, 39 through to, through to 42 uh, of, of, of the skeleton argument. Unfortunately, I do not think I will have enough time to read through these, but I can you direct our attention to Yes, yeah, please uh, direct the attention to the court to, to those paragraphs. Uh, 8.1 through to 8.9. Um, just a minor point uh, as well we'd like to touch on with regards to the issue of costs in the court of first instance. Um, the court uh, granted exclusion of a witness statement of Ms. Susan, uh, Susie, sorry. Uh, Abdul Nabi, uh, attorney of Clyde Co., uh, as requested uh, by, by the, the, the claimant. Um, however, the court in its, in its order neglected to um, mention that, so we would mm. like to um, okay. draw attention to that. Uh, and finally, uh, in conclusion, um, in view of what's been said and written in the skeleton argument, the appellant is requesting permission to appeal and invites the Court of Appeal to set aside the judgment entered into in the case on 20th of June 2016, the Court of First Instance, uh, in part relating to the Court's decision on the appellant's jurisdiction application and the stay of the, uh, and the stay of proceedings in the case until the uh, final uh, decision by the Court of Appeal is made. Uh, to invoke the voidness of the jurisdiction clause, uh, clause 38 of the agreement uh, on its own merits and to dismiss the claim for a lack of the DIFC uh, um, uh, court's jurisdiction or otherwise to dismiss the claim based on the provisions of Article 2 and 3 of the UAE Commercial Agencies Law uh, as the matter is not one being capable of uh, being litigated uh, by force of law uh, three, to compel the respondent to bear all uh, case-associated costs and expenses. Uh, four, in any event, and regardless of the success of the appeal with respect to jurisdictional matter, to vary the judgment in part relating to the costs uh, um, associated with the preparation of Ms. Uh, Susie, um, Ms. Susie's... Um, Abdel uh, Nabi. Yes. And um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yes, Lord. Your Honor, I'm going to make one preliminary point and then um, deal with the points of my learned friend. The preliminary point is that we're dealing here with a clear and very precise express exclusive jurisdiction agreement, which my learned friend admits and accepts is, is specific. And the burden of proof, of course, is on Kassab to show why this court has no jurisdiction. And we say they've not um, dealt with that burden of proof and satisfied it. 
and they have numerous, numerous hurdles to jump through. And in fact, we say that they've not managed to jump through a single one of those. I, I won't um, take the court through the skeleton argument, which the court has, which my little friend hasn't addressed in huge detail. This is this the one that you gave this morning? No, it's we, we filed it um, last Tuesday. Oh. What, but, it, but it is in the file. What, what you have given this morning? Yes. It's, it's in the file this morning, but we filed it with the court at, um, earlier. Yes. Yes. So, so the, that was, that's before the court, and I, and I won't take the court um, through that, um, but I may refer to it from time to time. But instead, I, I wish to make three propositions, which hopefully will deal with all the points. The first proposition is that the DIFC's jurisdiction is to be determined by the judicial authority law alone. In other words, UAE federal, civil and commercial laws do not apply. That's the first proposition. Proposition two is that the choice of law clause, which you've been told about, does not reintroduce UAE federal, civil or civil laws by the back door. That's not the effect of that clause. And the third proposition is that even if the choice of law clause does reintroduce back UAE federal civil or commercial laws, those laws do not and cannot undermine the exclusive jurisdiction clause. And the courts touched upon that already this morning. So to deal then with the first proposition, that the DIFC's jurisdiction is to be determined by the judicial authority law alone, I wish to take the court to the standard chartered case, which is at bundle B, tab 14. And in particular to page 181. Paragraph 94. It's page 181 of tab 14, bundle with B. So bundle B, tab 14, page 181. Chartered case, which the Chief Justice, of course, would be very familiar with. But um, I'm looking in particular at the sentence of skins, but these do not go far enough. And there's a reference here, um, obviously, the but these refers to what's stated at the beginning of that paragraph. But it says, but these do not go far enough to support the wider proposition that IGPL now advances, namely that the financial free zones, such as the DRC courts, must take into account the limits imposed by the CPC when determining questions of jurisdiction. The fact that the CPC provisions on jurisdiction are driven by considerations of public order is insufficient. IGPL must also demonstrate that the failure to apply the CPC to free zones would offend public order. Having regard to the legislative history underpinning the establishment of UE free zones set out above, such a conclusion is not sustainable. It's critical that the exemption of UAE free zones from the CPC is effective both at the constitutional level, and there's a reference here to Article 121 of the Constitution, which one finds by the way, at tab one of bundle, bundle A, at page 33. Um, that's article, and the federal level, article 3.2 of federal law 8, which one finds at bundle B, tab 7, page 74. And then what the judgment that Standard Charter says is two conclusions flow from this. First, the UAE free zone's exemption from the CPC in its entirety is consistent <coughs> and sanctioned by the UAE's legislation. And second, far from subverting public goals pursued by the state, the exemption is an essential aspect of the state's economic policy as implemented by the statute. So accordingly, even on the widest understanding of public order, it cannot be said that the UFC's exemption from the CPC is contrary to public order. In other words, the DIFC does not apply federal, UAE federal, civil or commercial law. And one sees a conclusion at Standard Charters of this discussion Paragraph 
is at page 183, where there's a reference to H.C. E. Justice Ali Al Madani's decision in X1 and X2, that the CPC does not apply to the DFC, and that the DFC court's jurisdiction is determined solely by the judicial authority law. And that's the point. And we've already looked at what that authority, judicial authority law says, 582, that where you have an, a, a, a specific exclusive jurisdiction agreement, that agreement may be upheld. Looking also at law number 10 of 2004, which one finds at tab, um, it's bundle B, tab 9, page 100, Article 19 of this law. This provision provides that the DFC court has original jurisdiction pursuant to Article 5A, so that's entirety of Article 5A, including 5A2, of the judicial authority law to hear any of the following. And then at 19D, one finds any application over which the DFC court has jurisdiction in according with DFC laws and regulations. And as we mentioned, the judicial authority law at 5A2 gives the court such jurisdiction. Looking at law number 10 of 2005, and that's at, in, that's at tab 10, at page, and I'm looking at page 124. Now this law is important because you were taken to this law to and in particular, you'll take it to page 123 to show the effectiveness of express choice of governing law. But one sees at page 124, and this is this provision you weren't taken to, at article 13, headed effectiveness of express submission to jurisdiction or arbitration, the following provision at 13.1, a submission to the courts of a jurisdiction and contract shall be effective. And that's exactly what we have here. We have an express submission to the courts of the DIFC, and as a matter of DIFC law, that provision must be effective. You're also taken to tab 12 of the same bundle, bundle B, to the practice direction, which sets out some suggested jurisdiction clauses. And this is, I'm looking at page 137. And what my learned friend wanted to take from this practice direction was that even where you have an exclusive jurisdiction agreement, that can be challenged. But what the court has to look at here is the wording of this practice direction. Because what it says, if you look at that, that paragraph, the second paragraph um, in this practice direction, it says that um, without prejudice, that in other words, the filing of the, 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 filing of the um, claim with the express jurisdiction provision is without prejudice to any subsequent challenge that may be made to that jurisdiction, and here are the important words, on the ground that the submission relied on does not satisfy the requirements of Article 5A2. In other words, if the court isn't satisfied that the agreement is express or specific or clear, then you have a ground challenge, perhaps. And, and of course, someone, the court, the fact that the, the um, registrar accepts the claim form doesn't prejudice a right of challenge on that basis. But what it doesn't say here is that a challenge can be made outside Article 5A2 itself. And again, this simply highlights the fact that we've already seen that the judicial authority law alone applies to the determination of jurisdiction by their DAFC courts. And that's Proposition 1. Proposition 2 is this issue of the choice of law clause. And what we say, again, is that this clause, as it stands, does not reintroduce UAE federal civil or commercial laws by the back door. Now, the court is right. There was an observation made earlier. But actually, the court isn't, in effect, dealing with choice of law. That's not what the court needs to do at the jurisdiction 
um, jurisdiction stage. But, we say, even if it does go into this, actually we'll see that the, that the choice of law doesn't, in this case, um, on, its, on its face, um, seek or serve to exclude or bring back sorry, UAE federal civil or commercial laws. Now, the, the approach to dealing with these kind of clauses is set out again um, at Standard Charter and also in the case of Talim. So I'm going to have to take you back to Tab B and Tab 14 to the Standard Charter case. But this time, looking at paragraph 125. What is the tab number? It's tab 14. Paragraph 125, where this judgment said it was held in Talim that the burden of establishing that the parties had agreed that the DFC court should not have jurisdiction was on the parties so contending. I already stated that principle in the outset. And two, the test to be applied was the ordinary and natural meaning of the words of the jurisdiction of the union, as they would have been mutually understood by the parties, having regard to the background circumstances and the nature of the agreement and the context in which the words are used. And then there's reference here also to the case of Deer versus Waterfront Property Investment. So that's the approach the clause should take to governing law and jurisdiction clauses. And what we say in application of this principle is that the parties would not want to agree to two different laws in this case, especially if one, civ one is civil and one is common law. Because what my learned friend is saying is, what you have here is an agreement for Abu Dhabi law to apply, the UAE laws as applicable in Abu Dhabi to apply, on the one hand, and yet on the other hand, the exclusive jurisdiction of the DIFC courts. And we say that that's, that's something that the court should mind against. If one looks at the case of Talim itself, and it's in the supplemental, by the way, At tab one, and it's page 14. And I'm looking at paragraphs 39 and 40, but 39 first. If one looks to the last um, half of the paragraph, beginning with the words, the assumption. So the assumption that in a clause such as this, the parties could have mutually intended to disassociate the body of law governing the contract from the court upon which they confer jurisdiction is, in our view, although theoretically possible, distinctly implausible. Their selection of one body of law can thus be assumed to reflect their agreement to confer jurisdiction on the courts of that one place where that body of law will be applied. And we say this principle applies here also. It's possible, but implausible, that the parties would want to agree to UAE law being the law applicable in Abu Dhabi if that law contradicts or undermines the exclusive the agreement for exclusive jurisdiction of the DIFC courts. We also said, actually while, while we're on the telly, we may just note paragraph 40, there's reference here to construing the law and jurisdiction clause in the way that has been stated in the, tally, in the um, standard charter case at paragraph 125, but that's by the by. But in terms of construction, we say that regard must also be had, and we've said this in our skeleton argument, to the fact that the Abu Dhabi courts themselves must recognise that the principle of UAE law, which grants the DIFC exclusive jurisdiction, and recognises that the DIFC applies only the judicial authority law to determining such jurisdiction. 
In other words, that the very Abu Dhabi law, which has been referred to, must recognise the right of the JFC's courts to take jurisdiction in this case. And my learned friend referred the court to Law 12 of 2004, which I won't take you to, but this is a, just for reference, it's at B, tab 8, page 87, which says that the JFC courts apply only their own law, but do apply the law agreed by the parties where that is stated explicitly, and the word there we wish to highlight is the word explicit, and also where public policy comes into play, then that law chosen by the courts won't be applied. What we say here is the clause here is not explicit enough to actually undermine effectively, on my learned friend's case, the exclusive jurisdiction agreement. And so in light of the above, we say that the court cannot conclude that the parties have agreed to reintroduce the federal law, civil and commercial, by the back door. And therefore it also follows that the judge was entitled to find that actually what the parties really intended was for the application of UAE laws as applicable in the DIFC, because of course the Abu Dhabi courts and Abu Dhabi law must recognise the jurisdiction of the DIFC. And therefore to follow the decision in Gavin versus Galen, that once you cross the line, in other words, once exclusive jurisdiction has been found, therefore it will follow that UAE laws mean the laws applicable in the DIFC. At most, we say, this law is, would be, the, the decision of law, in terms of the law, applicable law, would be ambiguous. There's another possibility, for example, is that the parties are saying that local Abu Dhabi law applies, or Abu Dhabi law applies but as long as it does not conflict with the AFC law. But what it doesn't do, on any basis, we say, is, as I said, somehow reintroduce federal, commercial, and civil laws. And that's Proposition 2. We then come to Proposition 3, which much of the court's time has been taken up for this morning. And that is the issue of whether, even if the UAE federal and civil commercial laws do apply in this case, which we say they don't, whether those laws actually give some other court jurisdiction, or exclusive jurisdiction, as is being contended. And we say that they simply do not. And what I'm going to do is look, of course, at the commercial transactions law and the commercial agencies laws, because they're the laws being relied on. But the court also must look at Article 315 of the Civil Procedure Law, which one can find at tab B, at, at, at bundle B, tab 3. One can find Article 31. It starts at page 50. Sorry, this is an extract from. Did I see it wrong? This is this is an extract from the Federal Law Number 11 of 1992, referred to as the Civil Procedures Law. Oh, you are into which bundle, please? It's a bundle B. Tab three. Tab three. And, and the article that I want to refer to is Article 31, which one finds at page 50. So again, just for clarification, we're dealing with the issue of whether, even if UAE federal which, which, which article are you are referring to? 31. So it's at the, it's at, it starts from the foot of page 50. And again, just to clarify, that the, the point we're dealing with is that even if UAE federal law applies, it would not, we say, undermine the exclusive jurisdiction clause granting jurisdiction to the JFC. And one sees this actually at 31.5, which one finds on page 51. And this says that other than the cases stipulated in Article 32 and Article 34 to 39, and this obviously applies to this, this um, law, it's possible to agree on the jurisdiction of a certain court to examine the litigation. In such case, the jurisdiction will be given to such court or the court in which circuit the prosecuted residence domicile or workplace exists. In other words, under UAE law itself, the federal law itself, express jurisdiction clauses, exclusive jurisdiction clauses, agree between the parties will be recognised, subject to these exceptions. 
And exceptions are stated here. None of them are applied. So, for example, if one looks at Article 32, that deals with real estate. Article 34 deals with inheritances, etc., etc. None of these provisions deal with the type of contract that we deal with here. And in fact, there's no reference here indeed. And this is, this is important and picks up something that was stated before and observed by the court. It doesn't refer to the transactions rule or the commercial agencies rule, which supports the, the proposition, again, which was, which was touted earlier, that actually those laws, even on their face, do not, in effect, um, suggest that there's exclusive jurisdiction to be given to the court stated in those laws. But those, under those laws, recognition will be given to express jurisdiction clauses. And we say this makes sense in light of Article 13.5. Sorry, 31.5. So that's, that's um, the civil procedure law. What I'd like to do now, then, is look at the commercial transaction law, look back at that law. And the court asked my learned friend this morning to try and apply that law in the context of the agreement. And what I'd like to do is actually take the court to what the agreement was about. The law itself, again, we should, we should look at this, it's at a, it's a bundle A, tab 19. Look first at page 204, which is the article 217, which you've already seen, of course. And what this says is a contract's agency, so this is the definition clause, is a contract with which a person is bound in a continuing manner and in a particular field of activity to initiate negotiation for the conclusion of transactions in the principal's interest for a fee. His task may include the conclusion and implementation of such contracts in the nature and on account of the principal. Now, the first point is my learned friend used, used the term contracts agency, but he also uses the term contracts proxy. And the question is, what is a proxy? A proxy is someone who stands in the place of somebody else. So, for example, at a shareholders meeting, you may appoint a proxy to represent you, to stand in your place and to vote on your behalf. And what we say is that the agreement, whatever, however it worked in practice, is not a situation of proxy and is not a situation of pure principle and agent. We'll look at the agreement itself in a moment. But that's, that's an initial point. The <coughs> second <coughs> point starts on the English version. I mean, it's really what the Arabic means. That's it? correct. So, so, I mean, proxy and agent are two English words used translate the same Arabic word, right? That's correct. And we, we acknowledge that, that ultimately it's the Arabic that we buying. We can only, I personally, can only work with the English. And in fact, I, I merely, what we, need, what we need to do today is merely show that the other side hasn't or cannot convince the court that, these, that these, um, this legislation applies. Uh, reading to one seven again, yes. isn't that what the agreement is all about? A contract no. agency is a contract which a person is bound in a continuing manner in a particular field of activity to initiate negotiation for the conclusion of transactions in the principal's interest for a fee. And when it comes to his task may include conclusion and implementation of that contract in the name and account of the principal. Isn't this what the... Or you're going to show later on? Yes. yes. The answer to that question, in short, is no. Because actually, the... Kassab is not concluding and implementing contracts in the name or on the account of the principal by the terms of the agreement. What in fact is happening, and we'll have a look now at the, at the agreement itself, on the face of the agreement, is that actually Kassab is contracting itself with third parties. And therefore it's not acting as a principal. But I'm going to come to that in, in a moment. I want to, also want to, I want to just show you the Court of Cassation case 447-2003, which one finds it bundled B. At tab 16. You say 16? 16, yes. And 
and looking towards the end of the page of this quarter cassation judgment. So page 232. In each page 232. So here the court cassation deals with Article 217. So in the middle of that last paragraph, it's established by the article the same word contract proxy, that you have that word used in this translation, is a contract which will present takes account of continuously against remuneration. And then it goes on to say the next sentence, the agent's task may include the execution implementation. So far, it's just a repetition of Article 217. Then the, the court here, the court of cassation, also then goes on to deal with Article 218. And then at the end, the last sentence of the page says, a lower contract agent is nothing more than a normal agent. It carries on its business with a great deal of independence and enters into contracts in the name of its principal and in its capacity as agent of the same, as well as in favour of its principal. In other words, what the Court of Cassation is saying here, it would seem, is that one of the features of this contract proxy or contract agency is that the contract is actually being entered into on behalf of, its, of the principal and in the capacity as agent. Similar, similar to English law, in yes. the common law. That's right, that's right. And, 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 and actually, and what we say is that when we look at the view, which I'll do right now, is that actually that's not what's happening. Kassab is not an agent acting into a contract on behalf of its principal, but actually dealing with, if you actually, you still have got two, three, three over them, you can see that this is contrary to a commission agent that enters into contracts in its own name, in favour of its principle, whilst the latter remains not a party in the contract. Thus, no, no legal relation is established between such principle and such party with which the commission agents contract. Sorry. Thus, no legal relationship is established between such principle and such party with which the commission agent contracts, and neither of them may file a lawsuit against the other directly. And that's essentially what we've got here. We've got CASA acting in its own right. Now, I said I'd look at the agreement, so we should do that, and that's at bundle A. Tab 13. You've been taken to clause 3.5, um, which which again is important, CASAB will be entirely responsible for the fulfillment of any of its agreements with clients and or clients' agencies for any CASAB sales. And CASAB will be solely responsible for any and all liabilities under such agreements. It's not binding a principle. And there's no term principle being used here. If one then looks at 14.2, the same agreement, Again, places all, this clause places all the responsibility on CASAB. Any and all bad debts arriving from CASAB sales or CASAB's responsibility, subject to discussion in good faith, less than able, in the most effective way to seek repayments and also manage such bad debt, particularly where such bad debt arises due to a client's bankruptcy or insolvency. In other words, it's the responsibility of CASAB to deal with bad debts. And in the case of any <coughs> doubt at all, one then looks at clause 30.1. Which in our submission, this is at page 124, foot of the page, which in our submission couldn't be clearer. Because what this clause says is unless, as otherwise agreed between the parties in writing, CASAB's acts in all its contracts, so it's CASAB's contracts, as a principle at law. So it's CASAB who is the principal. And nothing in this agreement, and no action taken by the parties under this agreement, shall constitute a partnership, association, joint venture, or other cooperative entity between the parties. In other words, the parties are expressly agreeing here that actually there is no relationship of principal and agent, and it's CASAB who acts as principal. And we say on this basis alone, at this stage of proceedings, that's sufficient for the court to say that actually there's no pure commercial uh, principal and agent relationship here. And what actually, that make, even what do you make of the term "all its contracts"? What does what do those words cover? Yes. 
Mm -hmm. Does it include this contract as well? Well, that would include that. This, of course, that would include this contract, but we'd say that goes without saying because CASAB is the, is the contracting party to this particular contract. But we yeah. say all its contracts refer to the contracts that CASAB is going to be entering into in order to sell with the third parties. Yes, with the third parties. Yeah. And it links back to what we said before in relation to the earlier provisions at 3.5. So you're saying that once CASAB is considered as a principal vis a vis the third parties, right. then that negates the agency because agency requires. The joining up of A and C and dropping out of B. That's exa exactly what we're saying. And we're also, and we've also, of course, said, linking it back to the, to the um, transaction laws, which is that actually to be, for that law to apply, Article 217, um, you have to have a pure commercial principal agent um, relationship. And there, there is one, one clause which I was uh, bothered about. Uh, you may have heard me ask. Made about it. Uh, something about uh, 4.7. Uh, but that's only in relation to SMA clients. Okay, so. Yes, 4.7, exactly. What, what this provision does, and we, the court looked at it a little bit earlier. But this is historical, it, it is sort of excluded from the scope of this agreement. That, right? in, okay. in a sense, it, it is, but in a sense, it's part of it. What effectively this clause does, it's not just historical. What it's saying is, you can be a representative, in other words, you can, you can, you can go and sell advertising on your own, in your own rights, enter into contracts with third parties. But there are clients which we want to deal with directly. And we, Sky News, are going to want to market and enter into negotiations directly with, with various clients. And then you can see them there at 4.2, the ADMIC clients, the SNA International clients. And, and we're not going to pay you contributions or we'll any commission in relation to that. And then that's what the whole of 4.4 does. The whole section 4 deals with that. But that is very different to the, to the, to the other sections, which then allow CASA to enter into direct contracts. So in other words, what we have here is two, two things. We have one part of the agreement allows CASA to enter into contracts with third parties as principal itself. And the other part of the agreement allows SME to um, enter into, or confirms that SME can still enter into um, contracts with these, these clients, the ADMIC clients and So, so that we have it in all in one sentence. Which are the clauses that you say uh, lead you to the conclusion that Kasab and the third parties, uh, or Kasab enters into contracts uh, as principal and not as agent on behalf mm -hmm. of SNA? Yes, again, it's... Can just list them out so yes, that we 3. have them 5, in one 3.5. Yes, 14.2. Sorry, 14.2, 14, 14 which deals with bad debts. We'd say that there's an inference there as well. 14.2. You have the, the no principle, the, the CASA backing as principal provision at 30.1. But even beyond that, 30.1. 30.1, that's the oh, one 30. I talked you to. 30, 30.1, that's the one I talked you to before at page 124. And in addition, if one looks at 9.1 and 9.2, yeah. and again, I, I won't necessarily, I won't take it unless you want me to, but deals with revenues, you can see how this, how this works. In other words, there are revenues being generated by virtue of Kassab's agreements, which then Kassab will be entitled to a share of. But what's not stated here that is, is that anywhere, in fact, we say, is that Kassab is entering into contracts for SNA or as a principal of SNA. And so those, those, are the, those are the provisions we rely on in relation to that. But how, I mean, can you assist me where Mr. Ahmed wasn't able to, how does the deal actually work? Um, in practice. Does Sky simply give a block of time, space to Kassab and say, well, this is your, as it were, um, this is your infant, this is your sort of entire uh, inventory? Yeah, inventory if you want to use that term. Uh, and you deal with it as you wish, subject of course to particular conditions. Uh, you sell it, but we will impose some kind of control over the price, and then when you sell it, then we will divide up the, uh, I think it's the revenue rather, rather than the profits, the revenue yes. uh, the between the parties in a certain a big percentage. Yeah. But I haven't I haven't got detailed instructions on this and I need to I need to carry what I'm about to say in relation to that. I haven't got and I'm of course not giving the court evidence. Mm. And there was no evidence put before the court. What I have been told and there's been there's been able to simply clarify some of the things that, that go on under the under the contract is that actually I, 
Before I, before I speak, I just want to clarify one point about the, about the, the question you asked about the inventory. I'm being told that that's correct. In other words, there's a certain inventory that CASAP are able to then sell. And, and actually what happens in practice, I'm told, is that CASAP very often will enter into direct relations with third parties, as, 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 the, as provided in the agreement has been told. And on other occasions, SNA will itself enter into a contract with a party, and we've seen actually a, a section four how that works. Mm -hmm. but what, what I want to know is this, whatever inventory is allocated to um, Kassar, um, I've noted the provision about the guarantee of minimum revenues. Uh, but if they do not sell the entire block of time space allocated to them, uh, they have to keep that. Uh, does it just is treated as unsold and as it were reallocated back to SNA to market itself or what? Uh, I need to take instructions on that now. I mean, it's not clear to me from, from that agreement because it, it's, 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 I mean, for example, you being from the UK will know better than I, but for example, the, the ticket agents, you know, yes. selling t uh, tickets for the theatres, I mean, do they return or do they have to uh, take control? And responsibility and underwrite. That's the thing. Do they underwrite the purchase? The answer is yes. They underwrite that. Yes. So, so they well, well. Actually, the way it works is that there is no agreed price, as it were, for the entire block that is being allocated to Casab, uh, as I understand it. But Casab has to guarantee certain minimum. That minimum becomes effectively the purchase price of the block. Yeah, they, I'm being told that they guarantee that they will sell a certain amount, but in actuality they always sell more than that amount. And that's what I'm being told. So your understanding, as you just stated it, apparently is correct. And then the dispute here is because they have not achieved their, their, their sales. No, I don't believe that's the dispute. I think the dispute is that there's money that's outstanding which they haven't then forwarded to us for amounts oh, that they've sold. And, and actually, an important point is at this point, and it's worth clarifying this, the claim as it's pleaded at the moment is merely for a declaration that, that the agreement has been terminated in accordance with the agreement. At the moment, there isn't a claim for damage. That may well come if, in fact, the SAP don't pay the money that are owed. And there is, a dis there is a dispute or a brewing dispute in relation to that. That may have to be dealt with as well. But at the moment, it's the claim is made for a declaration. So unless there's any other questions on the, on the agency issue, then what I was going to also then make a few <coughs> submissions about um, the construction of 226 itself, which, um, which we've had a look at already. So it's, we're back now at tab A, um, bundle A, tab 19. <laughs> Bundle B, which, uh, it, bundle B, which tab? It's bundle A, sorry, A. and it's tab 19, and it's page 205. So, just, just, to, just to clarify, there's two, there's two stages in a sense, there's two points really in relation to the commercial transaction law. Point number one is that that law and in particular, the articles 217. Right, before we uh, move uh, on, yes. uh, is your position that if you satisfy or if we accept your argument that uh, this contract doesn't fall within Article 56 because it's not a true agency contract, uh, then that disposes of the jurisdictional point? Absolutely, because, because my is a eliminate point. Yes, and the reason for that is because what my learned friend is saying is because that because it is a commercial co uh, agency's contract, a commercial proxy contract, um, that's what it's used. Then therefore, Article Two Two Six applies, which then gives the gives yeah. the federal. So, so now you're going to yes. back up argument. That's that's well. right. So then, so but if you find that the, that these articles don't apply, or there isn't sufficient evidence to conclude that they do, then that argument falls away completely. And the, and our secondary argument is even if you don't conclude that, in other words, if you say that Article 226, which is the jurisdiction article, whether, whether, if that does apply, our point is that that article does not, um, contrary to what my learned friend says, give exclusive jurisdiction 
to, to a federal court. Um, and, and if one, if one looks at that, it's at page 205 of Bundle A. And we do, we, do, we do agree with the court when they say that it's not entirely clear what this, what this clause, this article does. Uh, we have four points that we make about it. And the first is, even on the first beginning of the sentence, as an exception to the rules of jurisdiction provided in the law of civil procedures, it's not clear to us whether this clause, Article 226, is somehow meant to do away with everything in the civil procedure law, which we looked at. We looked at Article 31, if you recall. And in particular, 31.5, which gives the, um, the right of parties to agree to jurisdiction, it's not clear to us that, the, that this clause, the beginning of this, this article, um, is intended to do away with that, the entirety of the law of civil procedures. That's point one. And then the second point is, if one looks at the, again looks at this clause, the court within whose circuit the place where the contract is executed, and my learned friend says the executing is implemented, lies shall have jurisdiction. Well, the court within the, whose circuit the place where the contract is executed, well, we say the, the contract is meant to be implemented throughout the UAE, including the DIFC. And in fact, the territory, we should say, goes beyond the DIFC and the UAE and includes lots of other countries in the region. Um, so therefore, the DIFC would have jurisdiction in any event. Um, it doesn't say, it, says the, 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 it also says the, the court within whose circuit the place where the contract is executed shall have jurisdiction, but it doesn't say shall have exclusive jurisdiction. And this is the point that so the Chief Justice made earlier. It could have used that word, shall have exclusive jurisdiction, if it wanted to, to examine all disputes arriving from contract agency contract. Well, again, we say that it's, this isn't a contract agency contract as uh, defined. Would a reading of Article 226 lead to the interpretation that whereas in this particular contract, just uh, leaving aside the non-UAE <coughs> countries and just looking at UAE as a whole, the contract is to be implemented in the uh, all of the Emirates, and you can't say that um, you, you you can't say that only the court where shall we say, um, the breach of contract occur um, will be the, will only the court of that particular place of breach uh, or pl uh, breach will be uh, the jurisdictional court. No. Because in this case, the breach actually occurs through the entire territory because the termination is of the whole contract and therefore Kassab has nothing left, uh, and therefore there's be multiple breaches if you like, and therefore each uh, court in each of the uh, Emirates should have jurisdiction. There's no reason to single out any one. That's absolutely true in terms of breach. The, the provision itself actually talks about execution, which... which well, it's also meant to be performed. Yes, exactly. And, but your point is still good. In other words, it's performed everywhere. And therefore, wherever it's performed, those courts will have jurisdiction. However, we say, of course, the DIFC is one well, of those. This also addresses the other section we have yeah. that uh, cited the one about where the, um, the litigation arises. Yes, I mean, I'll come. That, that was what was pointing me to the brief. Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, yeah. um, so, 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 so again, on the full proposition, if the court does find that the articles on which um, Mr. Ackerman wants to rely do apply, which we say they don't, if they do, Article 226 doesn't give any court jurisdiction um, and still gives, still allows the DFC court um, to take jurisdiction. Um, so that, that's that point. So I want to now then, unless there's other questions on that, to move to the final law which upon which uh, Mr. Ackerman relies, and that's the Commercial Agencies Law. <coughs> And his position here is slightly unclear to us. Um, what he says, it seems, is that the commercial agency law applies and its effect is to render the contract void and therefore it's a void contract and therefore the DIFC court doesn't have jurisdiction. I think that's what he's saying. And our points in relation to this are dealt with in the skeleton argument. Our first point is, is the same as the judges and in a way it's been highlighted in what we've seen today and that is there isn't sufficient evidence, or sufficient evidence has not been produced, um, to show how, why the commercial agency law applies to the arrangement that, 
that we're dealing with. And um, I said in the skeleton argument that um, the no notice was given under Rule 29.133 of the DIFC court rules in relation to evidence um, dealing with non-DIFC law. Um, but we say that the judge was perfectly entitled to say that on the, the facts as presented, there's insufficient um, evidence for, to show that the commercial agency law has any relevance at all. But that aside, our position is that the commercial agency law doesn't apply even on its face. And let's look at that law. That's at bundle A, tab 19. And it's page 172. And we start looking again, as we did with the transaction law, at definitions. So when we see at Article 1, it gives a definition of what a commercial agency is. It's the representation of a principle by an agent for a distribution, sale, offer or provision of a commodity or service inside the UAE against the commission of profit. Then principle is defined as the producer or manufacturer inside or outside the UAE, or the producer's approved exclusive distributor or exporter, provided the producer does not practice marketing on its own. And I want to highlight here um, something that's been said and also been shown. That is these last words. Ex first of all, exclusive distributor. Now, my learned friend actually conceded that uh, this is not an exclusive arrangement. And also the last words, provided the producer does not practice marketing on its own. And we've seen already section four of the agreement, where in fact SME has a right to approach certain clients, as we find, um, directly and therefore to market and contract directly with them. And we say on that basis alone, it takes it outside these provisions, but there's much more than that. And then you have definition of agent here, a natural person that bears the nationality of the UAE or corporate person that is wholly owned by, the, by national, natural persons and is authorised under the commercial agency contract to represent the principal to distribute, sell, offer or provide, etc. And Again, we've looked, I won't take you back to the agreement, but we've already looked at what the agreement does, and we say it doesn't fall within this provision, because you have um, a right to market and approach clients, and it's not exclusive. But also, what's, what's important, if one looks at Article 6 of this agreement, which is, uh, sorry, this, this uh, legislation, which is at page 173, it says, the commercial agency contract shall be deemed to have been concluded in the mutual interest of the contracting parties. UAE courts shall be competent to consider any dispute that arises from the performance of the contract concluded between the part principal and the agent, and any agreement to the contrary shall be deemed null and void. So, again, if, you, if this legislation does apply, you have Article 6 to rely on, which grants jurisdiction expressly to UAE courts, of which the DIFC court is, of course, and this is accepted, a UAE court. So, again, the same two points that we've made in relation to the commercial transactions law applies to the commercial agencies law. Number one, they don't, that law doesn't apply to the situation. Number two, even if it does, then the DIFC court has no fear, it has jurisdiction. And here, it's, it's very clear indeed. And then, therefore, we're, we're left with the final argument. Well, this agreement's void. The agreement's void, said my learned friend in the skeleton argument, because... Um, CASAB is not owned by UAE National, um, and the agreement wasn't registered. And our point in relation to this is that that is not the effect of this legislation. You have one page 173 open. But before that, isn't there a threshold question? Is that a jurisdictional point? No. Or is that a substantive defence? It, well, it's, it's max of a substantive defence. I mean, it can, it, there can be situations where it's so obvious that this would not in anywhere near that realm. So we do say it's substantive defence. Yeah, so that, that is a defence on merits. Yes, absolutely. But I'm going to, I'm going to deal with... Can we say that? If this, if, that, if this agreement is void, that doesn't mean we don't have an agency agreement. So they should not, I mean, uphold the defence that this is an agency agreement, yes. and then they have to follow the certain rules they've been referring to. 
just stop this rejection yes. really, from the application. Is that right? I think that, I, I think that that's absolutely, we'd say that's absolutely right. What my learned friend seems to suggest, and we find this astonishing, is that if it's not an agency agreement, then it's nothing. In other words, if it's not an agency agreement, then it doesn't have any legal effect whatsoever. And not only that, but the jurisdiction clause has to fall away, because if the jurisdiction clause survives and the whole agreement falls away, then the DFC court still has jurisdiction. So my loan friend has, to, has, to, has a very, and a set of stuff, extremely high hurdle, a mountain indeed, to climb. And we say it comes nowhere near. And, and it's correct that it is a substantive defence that the other side are raising. But I can deal with it very shortly, and, and with your permission we'll do so. I only have a, a handful of points. And the first point is, if one looks at Article 3, you have it at um, the end of the article at page 173 on the page, which says, no commercial agency, it's right just before Article 4, of course, the last sentence, no commercial agency nor any lawsuit related to it is recognised if the agency is not registered. So the effect of not complying with these, these um, rules, if indeed they apply at all, if you say they don't, the effect, the only effect is that there's no commercial agency and a lawsuit can't be brought on the basis of commercial agency. What it doesn't say in, 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 on its face is that the, no action at all can be brought or that the, the contract itself is null and void, including every little bit. And what I've pointed out, and what we pointed out in, the, in our skeleton argument, is that when you look at the agreement, and again, you're on bundle A now, so if you turn to page one, um, one, two, is where the agreement really starts. 112. 112. It's actually, I'm actually looking at the provision of uh, 26, so it's page one, two, three. What term are you looking for? I'm looking for the, the I'm looking at the provision um, clause, uh, clause 26, which is headed severability. And the, the point that I want to make on this is the point that's been made in the skeleton argument. And that is what this what this provision does is an agreement between the parties that if there's any aspect of the agreement uh, or provision that it is void or illegal, then you simply strip that out and sever it from the contract, and the contract survives. And that's what the parties have agreed, and, and, and that really deals with the void question. That there can't be any voidness. The parties have agreed that actually if there is an aspect of this which is void, the rest of the agreement continues. And we, we go on to say in our skeleton that there are aspects of this agreement which are extremely important, because if one looks at 16.2b, which is at page 119, and we, again, we pointed this out in the skeleton, that CASAP represents, warrants, and undertakes. So that's a very strong language indeed. And then if you look at 16.2b, uh, that it has the right, power, and authority to enter into this agreement and carry out its obligations here under. Now, on my learned friend's own case, what he's saying is actually, no, we didn't have a right, power, authority, because we're not, really, we're not owned by UAE nationals. And actually, therefore, the agreement's void. We should have never read into it. First place, the whole agreement is illegal, you can't sue us on it, and the DIT court has no jurisdiction. And what we say is if my learned friend is right, which we say he isn't because actually the agreement does stand, then we will be bringing an action under this clause for all the losses and damages that flow from that. For breach of warranty of authority. Exactly. And, and an express and a breach of it, it's not even we, we, a breach of warranty of authority, of course, is a common law right, but we also have an express contractual right under 16.2b. And then the other point we made. Is, uh, and the point we've made earlier as well is that this agreement is not just, um, does not just involve the territory of the UAE, but all uh, lots of other territories as well. So even if the agreement in relation to the UAE is void, which we adamantly say is not the case, then we have still rights in relation to all these other territories in relation to which we've agreed. And of course, and we also point out, I want to take you to, to the authority, that even without the severability clause at 26, there is authority, well-established authority, and we pointed to it in, in the excerpt from Dyson and Morris, that jurisdiction clauses stand free and on their own as separate agreements, apart from agreements. And as far as the court, the DIFC court is concerned, that's the end of the matter. And I think, I believe that's the, that's the point that was being uh, carried out before. The, 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 only, the, other, the only other substantive point that was raised today was Article 102 of the Constitution. And we've not, this is a very late point, which, is, which has come out of the blue, and therefore anything I say now has been said without 
um, proper consideration and, and taking any expert um, opinion or, or the rest or, or instruction indeed. But um, we do say that this point wasn't prefigured earlier. My learned friend took, took you to page 37 of the skeleton argument where I believe he refers to Article 104. It wasn't clear to us that he, was, that he does refer to Article 102 at all. Um, it's a point that's been raised today. That provision, that provision. Shall we look at it? Yes. Um, that was it. It was tab three of bundle B. Tab one of bundle B. Tab one of bundle A. B. 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 the provision which is one of which is article 101 subsection 3 in which this document relies on personal state of civil and commercial and other litigations between the individuals I mean the first observation is that we're not dealing here with individuals we're dealing here with companies so that that to that, that straight away mm -hmm. then we have the point that says that that arise in the permanent that arise what does that mean well it was suggested earlier that that may mean that when you file a claim, there's no claim in the federal capital. Perhaps the cause of action has a geographical location. Well, th that, that may be, you say it's unclear, and on that basis alone, the court, the court can't um, decide. But then, and then, then the other point, and that was, that was raised earlier, of course, is that whenever anything happens, there's ever an amount of action in, in Abu Dhabi, according to this, it's taken a, a, in a way that my little friend suggests, then, the Abu Dhabi federal courts will always have jurisdiction, that simply isn't right. And then of course you've also got in the same constitution, Article 121, which, is a, which contains the carve out for free zone areas and the determination, and then they're giving them the right to determine the method of yeah, creation. Is this is at page 33. So this is Article 121. And this, of course, is the article which features in the standard charter case on which the court relied in that case to explain how the DAFC court is a recognised jurisdiction carved out from the UAE, where general UAE civil and commercial laws don't apply. And therefore, we say that even if the meaning of Article 102 is, my learned friend suggests, and we say it can't possibly be the case, but even if it is, and that has to be read together with Article 121, granting rights to the free zones, and of course, all the powers that those free zones have. And it's quite wrong for my friend to seek to rely on the Constitution, one to Article 102, to try and undermine those when, in fact, the Constitution recognises those powers itself. And in fact, the raising of this argument, we'd say, simply highlights the straits which my then friend no doubt um, finds himself in. And for all the reasons, uh, the, the last point before I sit down is the, in relation to costs. And our, our point in relation to that is that the judge did not get it wrong in relation to that. It's correct that he didn't accept the witness statement, our witness statement, um, of uh, uh, Susie Young uh, Nambi. The leader. Yeah, sorry, as, as a witness statement. But the judge did reserve the right to accept the submissions. And in fact, those, that statement contains numerous submissions which are of value, which we've relied on in our own skeleton argument for today's purposes. And therefore, it's right for, for us to have the cost of uh, the, um, the challenge to the jurisdiction. And indeed, of course, if it's a good service of here as well. Unless there's any further questions. What costs would be attributable to the affidavit? It would, only, it would be the preparation cost? Well, we say it, sh it shouldn't be those preparation costs because, as we say, those, those submissions would have to be prepared in any event. And it's, and it's perfectly right for the um, Sky News' lawyers to engage in the case and grapple with the case and write out the, their, their submissions and put those to the court. So it's very hard to say that there are any actual costs which arise from having these submissions put into the form of a witness statement. They'll be minimal, but I'd have to take instructions on the specific details, but they'll be very, very small indeed. But we'd say the, the judge was quite right to exercise his discretion, and say, in terms of costs, and say no costs will be awarded in relation to that. Yeah.
no cost. No, no cost. No costs of being awarded in relation to that. But yet, my little friend is saying is that the judge got it wrong because he granted us, um, so I knew, all the costs of the, of the challenged jurisdiction, forgetting that in fact he found for them on this one narrow issue. And what we're saying is the court was well within its well within its discretion when it decided to award us all of the costs of that challenge application because in fact those costs would be incurred in any event in terms of the witness statement because they are submissions that would have to be prepared and, and in fact overall looking at the matter of the round we, we were victorious. Well I haven't done the uh, comparison but uh, the question in my mind is to what extent was uh, Susie Abdul Nasir's um, witness statement used um, as or not used as but repetitive of council submissions in the original hearing yes um, I can't answer that without doing the comparison but so maybe, maybe somebody should do a comparison yes. maybe, yeah. maybe let us know by in writing so yeah. what, where, what I'm thinking yes. is this um, and I'm the one who drafted the practice correction so I know what I wanted and I didn't want this kind of uh, witness statement uh, because it should have been put in, in as a submission and if it was put in as a submission then of course you get to charge costs for preparing a submission so if the way that your side's case was structured when you argued this uh, jurisdictional challenge uh, was that you divided up some points were being made by counsel, other points were being made by Ms. Susie, um, then there has been no duplication of work. But if she is simply adding on, uh, you know, and trying to, uh, how shall I put it, gain additional credibility for her case uh, by filing a witness statement as opposed to a submission, um, then, uh, and she, she all she does is repeat the same submissions that were made by counsel, uh, then there might be duplication and a certain amount might have to be. Uh, um, we, under, we, we understand the Chief Justice's concern, mm. and, um, and what I've been told is that the application was originally meant to be on the papers only, so those were the submissions. So even um, if Your Honour is correct, and actually one would normally look at whether it's duplication or not, and not allow for duplication. We say that, that, that it was right for the submissions to be put in in the form that they were in any event, because the whole... No, the submit, that is, I'm, I had no, no, no issue no. with the submissions. Yes. It's the question of to what extent did yes. uh, the, the, the witness statement contribute to the court's knowledge? Yes. We, we would say that it did contribute to the court's knowledge, because act, as, as I stated that initially, that the intention was for the whole application to be dealt with on the papers, and therefore... This was the only opportunity that the that scan users would have to put forward their case. So you're saying that the witness statement was part of the papers? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yes, I think so, which, is, which is the point. This, this, the other point is, of course, uh, while, while completely understanding the point that, that the court doesn't want or require submissions to be made in the form of witness statements, this point, I don't believe, was part of the appeal. I think this is a point that's just been taken today. And, and we would say that on that basis alone, it's not right for, for a site. It's fine for us, it's perfectly appropriate for a side to take grounds of appeal when making applications, but it's not right to introduce a completely new ground for appeal and suddenly try and claw back some costs on the basis of a new point, which I believe it, it is new today. But reading from the judgment and your submission today, there was totally no reference to the affidavit at all. The, uh, there you is know, had there is some explanation of what agency is or something like that, what you were trying to explain yes. the bar. Um, that's not a, that's not entirely the case because um, if one looks at the skeleton argument in the supplemental bundle, one sees numerous references to the witness statement and points that that have been made there um, in the witness statement. Um, and, and in addition to that, I've, I've been taking the court and says my little friend to exhibit to the witness statement. So the witness statement served a very useful purpose for the court today and also features prominently, as one will see, in the skeleton argument. Well, ultimately, this only becomes relevant if there, um, there's an assessment. If, if there's an, an assessment? Yeah, yes. at, at the end of the day. Yes. Uh, look, whenever the, the issue of these costs are... Yes. Right. So, of course, you, you will, uh, I suppose as a formality, you're asking for the costs of this appeal as well. 
But you, we are indeed, just just to be clear, we're asking for the of course of the bill, but we're also asking for the costs of the of the, of the jurisdiction challenge in the, in the course of the first instance to be upheld in their entirety. Well, here in below. Then. Yes, they're in below. Yeah. Um, you done? Ah, uh, yes. Would you like to respond to anything, uh, Mr. Uh, no. Ahmed? Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, no, I don't have any uh, uh, specific uh, points to make. I would just like to reiterate all the arguments that were put forward in the uh, appellate skeleton arguments, and uh, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you to both counsel for assisting us. Uh, we will reserve our decision, and you'll hear from us in due course. All right.